Uh, anyhow, first, uh, let me uh, thank the organizers for making it possible for me to participate uh, in this event. Uh, I had many encounters uh, with boys over the years. I think the first time I actually met him face to face was uh, 89 in IBM. And uh, I, I was shocked at that time uh, to see this uh, young guy uh, with a, a nice, shy smile on his face. Can you get me one of these smiles now? I said shy, not sly. Shy. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason uh, I was so shocked is that uh, 10 years before, in 79, we had this special arrangement uh, uh, with uh, uh, this company that translated Russian papers into English so we could get a head start on, uh, in the competition uh, uh, translating boys' uh, uh, papers uh, uh, to help us uh, uh, in this game. And actually, uh, I was reminded by, by Ural that, uh, uh, about this uh, sending an invitation in, uh, a few years later, in 83, I actually invited boys uh, to give a talk at the annual meeting of the Israel Physical Society. And that letter came through, it came back, there was a letter, a nice, very, very nice letter from Boris, very polite, written with an old, broken down uh, uh, typing machine. Uh, I wish uh, you know, I could have brought it with me, but maybe I'll find it, I'll send it to you. Um, but uh, actually, uh, to me, out of all these many encounters I had with the Boris, the ones that are most memorable are, are those that uh, show that not only has a great taste in choosing a physics problems, but he can appreciate very well what is important in life, in other aspects of life other than science. So I'll just give you this example, that uh, even though he's partially intoxicated, as you can probably tell by expression on his face, and even though his two hands are, are, are full with uh, holding to some uh, soft condensed matter object, <laughs> he still wouldn't let go for this chocolate bar that uh, uh, keeps in his hand. So good show, young man. Keep it up, and many happy returns. OK, uh, so uh, since uh, lunch is looming, uh, I can hear the, the French fries already. Uh, buzzing, so maybe we should get, uh, get ahead with the program. And uh, uh, all the results that I'm going to show you today involve just one technique. You know where that picture was taken? By the way, Boris, that picture, you know where it was taken? OK, that's OK. Uh, so, uh, it's a field effect, which, uh, uh, you know, it's a three-terminal device. Everybody, I'm sure, familiar with it. What it allows you is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, it allows you to change, uh, uh, to change the uh, uh, carry concentration a little bit and move the Fermi energy within the band. And that can be reflected, uh, uh, like you see here, through the Einstein relation. You, you can uh, see the difference, the modulation of the density of states reflected in the change in the conductance. So this is just useful as a whole effect uh, in some sense. Now the question is, uh, would all, uh, you also expect to see a reflection of uh, a single particle density of states energy modulation? Um, usually the answer for that is uh, no, you don't expect that because field effect is conceived to be a thermodynamic measurement. But this is only true if you sweep the gate voltage slow enough, such that you are really close to equilibrium. And there are some cases where that is not uh, so. That would be implicit. I'm not going to discuss it explicitly, but it's going to be implicit in what uh, I'm going to show you. Now, the system, as Alec was saying, the system that uh, I'm going to show the main results, not all of them, but the main results, is a, a, a chalcogenide. Uh, it's a semiconductor. 
it's a narrow gap semiconductor of the order of 0.4. There is one particular uh, feature uh, to this semiconductor which is very useful, as you're going to see uh, later, which is the reason why I choose it. Uh, because uh, otherwise it is uh, quite similar to the indium oxide. It's also similar to the indium crystalline indium oxide in that it has a lot of commercial value. And that uh, is advantageous for us because that means that a lot of work has been done on it to characterize it, even band structure. This is the result, schematic result of the band structure, predicting that the Fermi energy would sit at the top of the valence band. So you get hole like conductivity. And sure enough, this is uh, reflected uh, in the field effect. You see that when you add the electron, the conductance goes down. And that uh, uh, result is uh, typical and would be seen, has been seen in our lab for dozens of samples with resistance of that value and smaller. But the reason we chose this material to work with has more to do with other parameters, in particular, the high density of states. It has a very high carrier concentration. OK? And you see, you see why, why is that uh, important for us? And then we knew, actually, we anticipated that if we choose a sample with a bigger amount of disorder, deeper in the hopping regime, we'll see something sort of different. And here is a typical example. What you see that still the overall dependence is what was before, this sort of linear dependence on the gate voltage. But then there appears another feature, which is called the memory dip. This is a non-equilibrium feature. It's the identifying signature of the intrinsic electron glass. And uh, uh, to, to show that it is a non-equilibrium, all you have to do is sweep the gate voltage slow enough, then it would not show at all. All you will get, again, is the linear dependency you see above. That is number one. Number two, it appears, the feature appears to be centered, in this case, at zero gate voltage. But that is because the system was allowed to relax while keeping zero gate voltage at the gate. You'll see later that that is not necessarily so. Now, that feature, since it has to uh, 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 be consistent with the upper one, uh, actually, if you study that as a function of resistance, uh, the amplitude, the relative amplitude of this feature uh, goes down as you approach the diffusive regime and disappears in the metallic side. It's a strictly, strongly localized regime phenomenon. It does not occur anywhere else. Now, we knew all that before we started. That's the beauty of all of that. We, we chose the material, and we expected all these results and more, which I'm not going to show. And in particular, we also knew what would be more or less the width of this anomaly. Now, how did we know all that? Not from theory. We know all that because this is not the first, and it's not going to be the last system that chose this intrinsic electron glass effects. Okay? There were many others. And uh, uh, what you see here on the main figure on the left is the width, which is defined here symbolically as a function of carrier concentration. And you see more or less a systematic dependence on the density. Here on the right-hand side, you see raw data. In this case, it's a, a four different amorphous indium oxide samples with different carrier concentrations. And you see that when the density is large, the width is relatively large. When it is small, it is much smaller. Okay, so this, so far, that has been the only system where you can do that systematically change the carrier concentration over a wide range. That is one of the advantages of the amorphous indium oxide. You cannot do that with the crystalline version. It has other advantages, but not that of flexibility. Okay? And all these results refer to this geometry, in particular to this spacer here. The capacitance actually is in charge 
also of determining the width. So you have to compare all with a certain uh, uh, spacer in mind. OK. Now, le let me stress that this width depends only on the carrier concentration. It does not depend on the disorder. You can uh, study a sample from a mega ohm all the way to 100 giga ohm and even more. And the width is going to be the same. OK? And many other things. OK. Now, uh, uh, where is the new guy uh, uh, show up uh, on this uh, scheme? It's over there. So uh, maybe by accident. I, I don't think, again, let me, let me stress, I don't expect that to be a universal curve. Uh, actually, I already know that it is not. The only thing which is included in this uh, figure are samples where, where uh, at least nine uh, different samples were measured. That would be the case of beryllium. OK? Uh, crystalline indium oxide are probably more than 100 by now. So this is a fa fairly serious uh, uh, indication that what we are dealing with. Two things, density dependent and a property, strict property of the insulating state. It does not occur otherwise. OK, that's important. Now, uh, as I said, these are not the only uh, system that show that there is another uh, set of systems, which is a slight, sort of different. That's the situation with Anderson insulators. Granular systems, many granular, actually any material that has been made granular and in the insulating regime show a memory dip. OK? Now, what is common to these systems? In terms of structure, they're completely different. On the left, what you see are one phase material, one phase. Space filling systems. And on the right are granulars. Okay? Some, are, some of them are magnetic. Some are potentially superconducting when the disorder is small enough. The only thing which is common to them, only thing, is strongly localized regime. So it looks like a completely generic effect, typical of the insulating or the hopping regime, if you like. Well, not quite. There are at least two systems that are easily made in, to be in the insulating regime. And uh, for some, for some uh, uh, peculiar reason, theoreticians to be, seem to be uh, uh, in love with them because uh, they think that they understand them. Uh, silicon and gallium arsenide. As far as I know, no memory dip has been seen in them. And no intrinsic electron glass effects either. So what is wrong with silicon? What is wrong with gallium arsenide? Um, by the way, uh, they are not uh, good superconductors either. Lucky for us, uh, uh, we don't have to uh, worry about this problem. It has been solved uh, for us uh, many years ago. Um, my point is, this is going to be, this is the introduction so far. Now we're going to go into the business. My point is that as far as I can tell, the only difference between silicon, gallium, arsenide, and the other systems is one and the same, carrier concentration. This sample that show a memory dip and are measurable, all of them have density of carriers which is above 10 to the 19 per cubic centimeter or even 10 to the 20th. That is why we chose this uh, uh, new guy because we, we knew based on this empirical result that this is going to be good. And it was. And I challenge you to find another one that doesn't show that, just one. Another system that show, has a high carrier concentration, push it into the insulating regime, and show me that it doesn't have a memory dip. And all the associated glassy effect that I don't have time to discuss. Now, where that uh, density of carriers can be uh, important in this game? Why it is important? Um, I think that either directly or indirectly, it's important, and this is what I'm going to show you. It is important in setting up the dynamics. It is 
either directly or directly responsible for the slow relaxation of this uh, uh, system. So uh, uh, I'm going to show you two different experiments to, to illustrate that, where I change carrier concentration by some means, and I measure the change in the dynamics of uh, appearance and disappearance of this, uh, of this memory dip. So uh, the first is going to be the main result. It's on this uh, Chalcogenide. Uh, we start now with a, a, a certain film, with a certain resistance, at, at all the time at the same temperature. Uh, and, and now we let it relax, not uh, under zero gate voltage, but at uh, uh, something close to six, six volts. And now you see that uh, uh, this uh, memory dip appears centered at this position, not at zero anymore. Okay? And the next thing that we do, after we take this sweep to find out where this uh, dip uh, resides, we uh, sweep the gate voltage to the other side, to minus six volts or thereabout, and park it there. Let the, sam the sample experience that volt new voltage for a certain amount of time. And then from time to time, as indicated there, we take another sweep to see what happens. And you see as time goes by, uh, the, uh, there is a new dip that appears at uh, the new equilibrium uh, position that we set, while the old dip is slowly decaying away. And if we plot uh, uh, the amplitude of uh, uh, the old uh, memory dip uh, uh, versus time and the amplitude of, of uh, the new memory dip as a function of time, this is how it goes. And that gives us a way to quantify, for comparison, the dynamics, where the two curves meet is more or less uh, what we'll call a typical time. Now, let me emphasize at this point that glasses are, are, are very tricky business. Uh, any protocol that you use, you must use precisely. Everything has to be the same if you plan to compare. If you want to change a certain parameter, make sure that all other parameters that you use in the protocol are one and the same, because otherwise uh, uh, things uh, are not going to be well defined. So uh, uh, now what we are going to do in this particular case, that's uh, where we're going to use this specific feature of this chalcogenide, which was quite surprising to us when we found it, is that we are going to change the carrier concentration. <laughs> that initially was 6 times 10 to the 20. And the way we do it, uh, I, I made a certain illustration of that here. This is actually the result. Uh, you start out uh, while measuring the conductance as a function of time. So, so you let it uh, proceed for a certain amount of time just to, uh, to form a baseline conductance, just to make sure that it does not uh, uh, deviate up or down so that you are more or less in equilibrium, as far as you can tell. And then, at this time, you turn on a small infrared source. Let it stay there for a couple of seconds, and, and, and it goes out, and the conductance first decreases quickly, but then slower and slower, eventually it hangs up there uh, for a very, very long time. Actually, uh, at this temperature, uh, if you want to get rid of it, you, uh, you have to wait like 3,000 years for that to come. 3,000 years. That would be the time that uh, this uh, will dissipate itself. But you can get quickly uh, rid of it by warming it up above 30 or 40 degrees Kelvin. This is a well-known phenomenon in semiconductors. It's called <coughs> persistent photoconductivity. It's associated with increase of the carrier concentration. Uh, generated, photo generated by, by the infrared source, which is more than enough uh, for this uh, narrow gap semiconductor. Uh, I'm not going to go into the mechanism uh, of uh, what prevents uh, this uh, electron and hole from recombining, and, and uh, th th that's another issue. I'm just going to use the fact that we have the same sample with the same grain boundaries, the same, more or less, the same defect now is a higher carry concentration, which is uh, 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 not, not so easy to achieve while you have such initial high carry concentration. Usually, persistent photoconductivity is observed 
in lightly doped semiconductors. It, does, it is not observed in samples with, that have carry concentration over 10 to the 20. So why that happens here, I don't know, but uh, we use it. So now we have a new sample, and we want to measure the dynamics and compare it with dynamics of the same sample, OK? Now with a higher conductivity. Conductivity is not much higher. It's a, less than a factor of two, OK? So now we repeat the same procedure, which is called the 2 deep experiment, which is self-explanatory why we, it's, it's called that way. And actually, uh, uh, you don't even have to plot it, but uh, I do, I do this, uh, this plot for you. And you can see that the dynamics actually has slowed down considerably. So the conductance went up, and the dynamics became slower. You can see it in the raw data. It takes many days for it now to, uh, uh, for, the, for the new, new memory dip to form, and the old one to dissipate. You don't have to plot it. So this is a dramatic, dramatic effect. But it is not isolated. We have seen it before. So that is the first experiment. Let me uh, remind those of you that do know, most of you don't, uh, that uh, that is an old experiment that we keep adding uh, points to over the years, because all those experiments are quite time consuming. Uh, in which this case, uh, we do something else. We still use this protocol of two deep experiment. But we employ the amorphous indium oxide. Uh, in this case, what we do is we make different samples and with different composition. And therefore, they have different carrier concentration. And now we plot this uh, uh, typical time that we get from the two deep experiment as a function of carrier concentration for a series of samples that are all amorphous indium oxide. They are different, but uh, all of them are amorphous with different carrier concentration. And you see that uh, as you uh, go to higher and higher carrier concentration, if anything, dynamics becomes slower. Now, uh, at, this, at this point here, um, those samples may, may become superconducting but not with this resistance, of course. Those one there are not superconducting, even if you make them metallic. Uh, but uh, I, I don't see the connection. OK, so uh, uh, what I'm going now to do is I'm going to have a quick summary. Um, what we have seen is that uh, using two different methods, we have seen that either by changing the carry concentration by composition, by a different LOE, uh, or by uh, persistent photoconductivity. One and the same result. Dynamics becomes slower. Okay. Now, that is consistent with the fact that in low carrier concentration systems, like, like lightly doped semiconductors, relaxation is so fast that you cannot observe the memory dip that should be there as well. You cannot observe it with a field effect experiment because you cannot sweep the gate voltage fast enough to be out of equilibrium. System relaxes much too fast. That would be consistent with that. Now, there is a certain experiment that was done and uh, reported several times that I heard. I mean, it was published a few years ago uh, uh, on silicon. Uh, in, the, in the deeply insulating regime by uh, optical means, where some slow relaxation was observed, but it was quite fast. It, the, the title of the paper was ultra, ultra fast slow relaxation, something like that. So that, that is consistent with this. So either directly or directly, what we do not know yet is are many body effects necessary to get this uh, slow relaxation? or it's just enough to have strong enough disorder. I personally believe that the main reason is disorder, and many body effects are, are probably on top. But uh, 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 that remains, remains to be done. And with that, I, I thank you for uh, being such a ni nice audience.
and I take again the organizers for giving me the opportunity to say my piece. Thank you.